Me, no, Elam, not quite. Uh, welcome to TRC 57 Speaker Series Learning with CES. Um, my name's Ted Cadwalder, I'm your host, uh, along with my great friends Sam Kwatan and Swatha Tanat, Stephanie Johnson, and uh, Lawrence Mitchell. Um, as we always do, we'll follow our protocol. Uh, the land here speaks hope to meet them, so we will turn it over to our friend Sam Kwatan to open our house. Eight squail muck sweet. I'll eat in a squallow and quonus muck ula mala. I tap a cusiella but you know it. On a sleek one, I see at the PM Schwakwa, Sarah Marie Weeb. Did I say that right? I just got E. Ted E. Squeeze a tent and not. I eat tap a CM and a swallow. And that's that. Oh, to keep a tanakwail e deetlum e slatican stuck to swallow another and share a prayer and a song, my friends. Hi, Tabka. Gachas Osmain Height Akus needs. The height at the house squail. Height at the hill. I I met Tamah. Eat a muck them yet na. Height got an aswala qua tito na met it na squail. Need that patam at nawa tihuam e amastal akutha eight squalawan. Ihuam eat eight over talk to the Marsias. Ihuam eat lachant to swallow quas the new at the cocky out. Ihuam eat lachant stuch tana salawa swallow qua. Haitchka quat qua eat an atama a tanaquil to muck squail. Now a squam quams at us at least, Aitchka. Oh, 
A song I haven't heard before. I, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as we uh, turned it to Lawrence, uh, we're on Hulkamitnam speaking territory. And one of the teachings from our territory is uh, uh, this land speaks Hulkamitnam. So we start off in that language in respect to the land and uh, respect to the people who've uh, lived on this territory, nurtured the territory, and been nurtured by it forever through that language. So my age come, my friend. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this Learning with CA, it's a series. Uh, the TRC 57 speaker series is a project by Nanaimo Ladysmith Public Schools, uh, both of whom Steph and I, Stephanie and I have worked for over the years. Uh, and we're very pleased to be doing this in our fourth year. We're also in partnership with the Vancouver Island Regional Library. So if you're in a viewing party in one of the regional libraries on the West Coast here, uh, welcome everybody. And our partner through all of this, connecting us with amazing authors and their ideas that they've shared is uh, UBC Press. And we're very pleased to be in, in close partnership with them over the last four years. We are quite, a, we're quite excited today to welcome uh, Dr. Sarah Marie Weed. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the School of Public Administration at the University of Victoria. So. TRC 57, uh, that call to action fits right in with the work that she does there. Also an adjunct professor at University of Hawaii, Manoa. Um, that's quite a connection as well. Um, so uh, we're, she's joining us today to talk about, uh, uh, through her new book, uh, Life Against States of Emergency, Revitalizing Treaty Relationships from Ottawa Piscat. If you'd like to buy that book too, you can just uh, get the 20% discount on our website. Um, Dr. Dr. Sarah is an author, uh, I'm gonna say activist too, um, and following uh, Senator John Lewis's rule is uh, looking for good trouble. Uh, so we're very pleased to welcome you here today, Dr. Sarah. The floor is yours. Amazing. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, for the kind words, the music. Thank you, Lawrence, for the moving words and singing. And uh, I love the invitation to, to search for good trouble. <laughs> that really does speak to me. And coincidentally, I've been invited to speak um, actually at the Senate to talk about Bill C-226 to end environmental racism in Canada. So I definitely see that in the, the spirit of making good trouble. Um, I do have some slides prepared. Is it possible that I could share my screen? There we go. So thanks again for this invitation to share with you all today. Um, the title of uh, my remarks is You Are Treaty Too. And these are words that uh, Chief Teresa Spence shared with me early on in our research collaboration. And so it, it makes me think about um, the responsibilities I have as a non-Indigenous academic uh, trying to work in solidarity with communities to amplify their voices and perspectives and, and also to revisit um, the Idle No More movement, uh, the peak of which took place during the winter of 2012 and 2013. And here we are over a decade later. And I think a lot of the messages theme still resonate to this day. Uh, and uh, I wanna talk a little bit too about community engaged research and, and what it's been like to work closely with the the community over the years. Um, the picture you see here also, I think, gives some life and expression to um, the book and the themes and the movement and the, the agency and, and the sense of um, kind of movement and moving forward that I want to also bring, um, noting that um, there's, there's an ongoing need to engage in these conversations about what it means to be in a treaty relation, something that I'm learning about and I uh, don't have all the answers to, but I think nevertheless, uh, look forward to being kind of part of this ongoing conversation. 
Um, so a little bit about who I am and how I've come to this place and this work. Um, so I'm a Canadian citizen and I grew up on unceded Coast Salish territory just outside of Vancouver on a body of water problematically known as the Indian Arm. And uh, my home along this inlet uh, looks towards the Kinder Morgan pipeline terminus. And so struggles over environmentalism, extraction, um, environmental justice have long been uh, on my mind and in my heart since I grew up in this region. Um, I was fortunate to do um, some early studies at the University of Victoria, um, leave for uh, Ontario for uh, my doctorate work and, and PhD, and then to return back home before moving overseas to Hawaii, um, where I started my uh, academic career. And I've now returned um, to the island here. Uh, in Saanich, um, where I'm located on uh, territories of many Lekwungen speaking and with Saanich peoples, uh, and hold the position of an assistant professor in the School of Public Administration. Um, a lot of the themes um, that I focus on in my work include uh, environmental justice and political ecology, and increasingly I'm uh, encouraged to think about a planetary health lens to the work that, that I do and trying to think not just about um, human impacts but ecological impacts of climate change, of colonialism, and, and to think in kind of more holistic ways. I am based in a school of public administration um, and uh, it's interesting there are uh, different types of scholars in this um, in department but one thing that does seem to unite all of us is a commitment to thinking about what uh, TRC call to action 57 means in practice. Um, we recently had a whole uh, one day retreat on this and create a work plan and are very committed to bringing this kind of education into our classroom and our curriculum. Um, one more thing just to mention here before moving on um, is the work that um, led me to um, this emphasis on treaties and working with um, Chief Teresa Spence's um, previous community-based work in a region known as Canada's Chemical Valley, where this uh, community, the Amishang Nation, is completely surrounded by um, petrochemical and polymer refineries. Um, and so this is one of the densest concentration of refineries in Canada and possibly the world. Um, and there are some resonances to the impact of the De Beers diamond mine in, in Attawapiskat, um, which I will talk about in a moment. So I mentioned um, TRC call to action 57. I feel like this is, you know, directed right towards people like myself who are teaching, you know, courses on government and governance and research methods and sort of the, the mechanics and the machinery of how governments function and make decisions and uh, really have this sort of attention to, to power relations. And um, so noting here, you know, we call upon all levels of government um, and to educate public servants. And I, I feel like, you know, I have this privilege of being placed in a school of public administration and also have a, a duty to, to try to do this work in a good way. And a lot of students are really interested in learning about um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and how to implement that in, in the province of British Columbia. We have the Implementation Act. It's, it's law and every ministry, every government agency is, you know, expected to adopt um, this act and to think about it. And, and what I'm realizing is um, a lot of uh, government officials and agencies are still figuring out what that means. And so it is a really important uh, role to play in the kind of academic uh, world to create space for um, figuring out how to do this in a good way. And I hope that this work and conversation and, and further education can contribute to that. Um, so the book that we're here to talk about today, um, and thank you for the plug and generous introduction, um, Life Against States of Emergency, Revitalizing Treaty Relations from Attawapiskat. Um, this uh, has been a long project in the making, um, started in uh, 2012, right around the time when I noticed a lot of solidarity organizing between members of the Amjanong Nation and Attawapiskat. Um, so I was at that time finishing up my uh, community-based research with members of, of that nation, seeing young people um, mobilizing, um, engaging in fast, um, blockading rail lines, really trying to um, show Canadians that, you know, we need to do better in taking Indigenous rights and relationships seriously. And seeing that kind of solidarity, um, seeing how uh, Chief Teresa Spence really brought forward that kind of mobilization, that passion, that that engagement um, really resonated with me. And at the same time, seeing all of the um, 
media coverage and sort of the lack of understanding of uh, what it means to be in a treaty relation caught my attention. And part of the book highlights some of the problematic narratives that the mainstream media covered. Um, and instead this book really aims to center the narrative uh, and perspective of Spence and others about treaty relations. Uh, un unfortunately, a perspective that was not as highly covered in the media's representation. And unfortunately, Teresa couldn't join us today as she's under the weather, um, but I, uh, I'm grateful for uh, her friendship, for her mentorship, and for teaching me so much over uh, many years now. It's been since this work began in um, 2012. Um, so with any good academic study, we often talk about our research questions. And um, the image I have here to correspond with this is an image of the river, the Catawathacat River, um, that just uh, weaves on the outer edge of the community there and shows the color and the beauty. And I want to highlight that that is one of the key aspects of this work is trying to show the community in a different light, not just one that is grayscale. So if you Googled Attawapiskat, for example, you would see a lot of, you know, gray colors and um, derelict housing. And, and that's really not telling the whole complete story of the community. And so this collaborative work is really an, an effort to, to challenge those misrepresentations of, of Attawapiskat. So one of the initial research questions is how were media representations uh, framing her fast, which was more widely known as a hunger strike. And so that's, you know, one intervention there is, is naming it as a fast, not just centering the kind of outsider language of hunger strike. Um, the second, uh, high level, but also very personal question. What does it mean to be in a treaty relationship today? And then finally, what do alternative decolonial sustainable futures that are grounded in Attawapiskat community perspectives look like? So where is Treaty 9? So Treaty 9 um, is the territory that um, covers Amjana, uh, sorry, Attawapiskat. And Attawapiskat um, joined this treaty during adhesion. So the initial signing of the treaty was in 1905, um, and then some adhesions were later signed um, in 1930 and subsequently there. Um, so you can see um, this is a historic map showing um, the location of, of Treaty 9 um, at the shoreline of the Hudson's Bay and then further south um, along the shores of James Bay. Um, and uh, in the book, I talk uh, a bit about some of the different ways of thinking about treaty relations, um, trying to counter the conventional colonial approach, which has centered more on thinking of treaties as contracts, as land surrenders, um, rather than um, what many Indigenous leaders like Teresa would advocate for, which is much more of a living um, concept of a treaty relationship. And so um, thinking through what that means in practice for public administrators and others is is a challenge, but is a really important thing to, to take seriously. And it's not just sort of a, a nice idea, but it does have really practical implications. And if I can offer one concrete example, um, this approach could apply to all kinds of agreements. Um, I know Carrie Newman, a scholar, uh, Indigenous scholar based at UVic has talked about it in relation to museums, for example. Um, it can also relate to impact benefit agreements. And I know that's something that has been a huge concern for many community members and leaders from Attawapiskat with respect to the De Beers diamond mine. Um, the problem is once uh, impact benefit agreements are negotiated, they're private, they're challenging to renegotiate, but um, leaders like Therese and others would advocate for revitalizing a conversation and having a, more of an iterative approach to these kinds of agreements. And so that, that treaty perspective, as I have come to understand it, is about that ongoing dialogue, that ongoing relationship, rather than sort of signing away something um, as a transaction. So it's really trying to challenge that transactional approach. So I mentioned uh, in brief the uh, experience of uh, Attawapiskat next to the De Beers diamond mine. So this mine has now closed. Um, so for those of you who may not be familiar, um, this is a diamond mine um, that has been 90 kilometers west of Attawapiskat for many years um, and does bring or had brought some benefit to the community in terms of employment opportunities, but also brought challenges with respect to environmental um, contamination. 
But in the book, I also talk about the symbolism of diamonds and how there's this kind of paradox um, that is real that really comes to light for me when you look at something like the mace. Um, so as a political scientist, I, I find these sort of symbolic objects very fascinating and troubling at the same time. And um, for those of you who may be familiar or perhaps are calling in from abroad, you may not know that we have this tradition where we would literally have our sergeant at arms um, parade in this mace to open up our democratic deliberation. So it's this medieval weapon um, that we use to, you know, convene democracy. There's something that seems very um, unsettling about that. And it's even further unsettling in the context of Ontario, where the mace is adorned with diamonds from De Beers diamond mine. So there's this kind of extractive quality to it. Um, there's this, this layer of, of, of subtle but symbolic violence. Um, that is very felt in, in communities at the same time. Um, so we might look at a mace, think, oh, it's beautiful, it sparkles, it glistens, it convenes deliberation, but there's so many layers of violence here. You know, the mines, um, the, the lack of um, meaningful contributions to the community, the lack of cleanup of contamination over the years, um, the lack of recognition of the ongoing treaty relationship, that kind of legacy of extraction, um, all of that has contributed to this ongoing environmental violence um, that the community has experienced over the years. Um, another contextual piece um, that the book draws attention to is the repetition of state of emergency declarations. And so um, one of the more high profile state of emergency declarations that took place in Attawapiskat um, was around the housing crisis. And so that was one of the motivating factors that led Teresa Spence to engage in her ceremonial fast. Um, but I will note, as you can see in this timeline, there were also several state of emergencies that um, predated that particular event. And then there have been subsequent ones as well related to flooding, uh, mental health being one that took place during the time that I was working with the community. Um, and then more recently, um, water quality issues as well. And on the right here, this is a picture of community leader and musician, Adrian Sutherland, who has performed actually in Nanaimo at the Port Theater. And I had the opportunity to um, attend a, a one of his his shows and do an interview with him after. And so actually a lot of his wisdom and words are in the book. And um, when I wrote this book, uh, I ended with um, a concluding chapter about artistic movements and that feeling of kind of energy and joy um, through these more kind of emotive expression, expressive uh, ways. Um, but my reviewers all said, well, that's the best uh, chapter. So that should be first. And so it caused me to totally redo the entire book. Um, and so now um, this chapter featuring a lot of Adrian Sutherland's wisdom is there. And I should give a shout out because I know that Adrian's writing his own book, his own memoir. And um, I, I hope that maybe he could participate in a series like this in the future. I'm waiting with bated breath for that book. Uh, and I'll also mention that this picture um, he took, um, and this is before the pandemic, um, before the height of the pandemic, but he took it to symbolize the fact that it's hard, hard, uh, it, you're struggling for breath, struggling for life in a toxic environment. And he was really trying to draw attention to water quality um, and, and posted this selfie on Twitter, which um, I've used with his permission in the book. And Teresa Spence. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry she wasn't able to join us. I'd love to hand it over to her to, to share her story in her own words. Um, but I will share a little bit about how I got to know Teresa and, and um, what I was looking at through my research and, and what she helped me understand. Um, and I, I asked her, you know, what's your favorite picture uh, of all the images that were taken of you? And so this is the one that she drew my attention to. And I, I like this one as well. It shows kind of her, her strength and, um, her um, sincerity and contributions to this conversation about treaty relations in a really significant way. Um, so my interest was in framing and so how the media has framed the community in Ottawa, Piscat and Spence over time uh, with a specific kind of focus on the events leading up to and following um, her ceremonial fast in the winter of 2012 and 2013. So my analysis in the book engaged in a review of media coverage. So all the kind of national mainstream coverage like Globe and Mail, National Post, Ottawa Citizen. Um, for example, I did a sort of keyword library database search and looked at you know, these messages 
pulled out these themes and noted themes, very problematic colonial themes of blame, uh, crisis, and accountability. Um, and I think crisis is often how the problem is framed. Uh, blame is often uh, how uh, outside authorities would attribute, you know, what's going wrong. The, the problem of the crisis is, is the result of some sort of community failure and then accountability. And, and if anyone, you may or may not recall that the conservative government at the time, their response was to send in this third party manager to overlook the finances, a complete colonial encroachment of, of self-determination. And so, the discourse analysis uh, maps these narratives, the, the problematic narratives, and instead says, you know, there's there's something missing here, and it's this narrative about treaty relations and taking the sort of embodied corporeal sovereignty that Chief Spence is enacting, taking that seriously as a call to action for Canadians to acknowledge treaty relations. And I, I, my, I include myself in this. I didn't grow up learning anything about treaty relations in, in high school. And um, I think there's just a complete lack of understanding about kind of the context for treaty and um, being situated here in Vancouver Island. Of course, the Douglas treaties are an important um, contextual piece here that I've learned more about later in life, um, but again, didn't learn a lot about that um, growing up. Uh, so one of the very first people that I met in community was uh, Rosie, and uh, Rosie took me around. Um, she invited me to uh, a powwow in the community. That was my first um, visit, and I was recommended to connect with Rosie um, through another uh, youth journalist from the community. Said you need to talk with Rosie, and so we spoke on the phone. I met her, and she kind of showed me around and connected me to people, including the. Um, uh, chief at the time, the new chief, that as at the when I first uh, went there in 2015, uh, Teresa was not the chief. Um, so met with other officials as well as the high school art teacher. Um, and so Rosie was essential to, to making those connections. And I um, couldn't have done this research um, in a community-led way without someone like Rosie, who was so generous and trusting, um, and uh, enabled me to kind of learn more about. The community in place and, and here's Rosie um, dancing and um, again showing that color and that beauty and that liveliness and that connection um, and again a lot of these more um, kind of beautiful joyful scenes are not as frequently depicted in the media and so I think it's really important with permission and consent to to show this this connection this this love and this care for one's place and environment that's beyond the grayscale images the, the da damage centric kind of images that are so predominant in the media um so after i got to know um rosie and was invited to visit and volunteer at their annual um powwow i started meeting people and began to build a relationship in particular with the um art teacher in the community, uh, Mandy Alves, uh, who invited me to collaborate uh, with her senior art class. And together we created the uh, Reimagining Attawapiskat Gallery. And I'll show the website for that in a moment. Um, and young people uh, like Jack Linklater, who's depicted here, um, participated in this project and shared their stories. So when, when you look at the gallery, there's a range of uh, photographs, paintings, um, and digital stories as well. And so there's a few really powerful ones and, and one of the ones that really um, resonates with, with me in particular is Jack's story where he talks about learning from the trees, learning from the water. And it's just, uh, it just shows his wisdom beyond his years. And, and, and Jack subsequently went on to be a member of um, leadership in the community as a council member. And so it's really amazing to, to, to see that um, that leadership and, and know that he's kind of contributing back um, in a good way for his community. Um, so this is one of the murals created by the art class with Mandy and her students. And um, I just, again, love sharing the, the, the color and the beauty and um, noting the importance of education in the community. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Shannon's dream and a young woman named Shannon who advocated for years for um, access to education in the community. And now there's um, a legacy fund as well, which the royalties of the book um, go towards to support access to education for indigenous. Um, young people. And so this was a, a, an honor, a sort of a memorial uh, mural towards um, Shannon and her legacy. 
So I mentioned framing, so kind of a critical analysis of uh, mainstream or hegemonic portrayals of Attawapiskat, and then the reimagining Attawapiskat project, the community-based, arts-based project, is much more focused on reframing, so centering the narratives of community members themselves. And I will say that I learned a lot along the way. I uh, I didn't plan to do this kind of research. I just uh, wanted to do sort of a theoretical analysis, docu documents stick behind the archives and the media articles. But I find sometimes you get called in to do work with community and then it's hard to say no. And I thought, I'll just do one interview with Teresa and that'll be my participatory aspect to it. But then she said, oh, you have some art skills. Maybe you can work with the youth. And all of a sudden, you know, one thing you get recommended to another person and uh, are referred and, and make these connections. And before you know it, you're doing arts based workshops and getting grants and building teams. And so uh, we are really fortunate um, that we had a partnership, um, uh, a grant that was funded through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. So we could pay for a community based research assistant um, and also some Indigenous artists to. Um, co-curate the digital stories that are on our website. And so um, the workshops involved, um, you know, initially I had this whole plan to look at media coverage and have a discussion of the, the problematic framing, but I soon learned that that was not very appealing. <laughs> Nobody was really interested in, in you know, revisiting that um, content. And so we just scrapped it <laughs> and thought, let's just Let's just instead look at what we already have that's beautiful and that st is strength based. And so um, rather than focusing so much on the external media coverage, we, we started, you know, sharing amongst ourselves in the art class um, what works had been created by the young people. And then uh, the art teacher gave them time to go gather more images and photographs. And so we um, over a series of visits and workshops over several months, um, put together this online gallery. And so you'll see some photographs uh, and some of these appear in the book as well. Um, and they, they live here on this website. Uh, so our team, and when I say our team, I include um, the art teacher as well as some indigenous artists who are involved and then some of the community research assistants and participants. Um, together, we kind of came up with this mixed media storytelling methodology framework. So we weren't really focused on one particular art form like just photography or just painting, um, but wanted to create space for whatever young people in the class wanted to share as their um, kind of artistic output and they received credit for their art class th through this project. Um, and so um, my interest was kind of challenging mainstream media portrayals. That's kind of where I was coming from, trying to um, think beyond these sort of harmful narratives and then co-create alternatives. And so we a lot of emphasis here, I think, goes on that co-creation aspect, um, and that requires humility, kind of leaving your agenda behind and, and you know, listening, learning from those that you're um, working with and collaborating with, which isn't always easy to do for academic because we're sort of trained to have agendas and research objectives and hypotheses and, you know, metrics for collecting data and so on. Um, so this is certainly more uh, aligned with a participatory community-based ethos, um, which is nevertheless just as valid as quantitative data and statistics. And I'm always fighting that battle, trying to remind people that community-based knowledge is just as legitimate as a survey. Um, so um, through this kind of arts-based collaboration, uh, we really want to center the, the the beauty, the strength, the voices, and the perspectives of community members with a focus on young people. So in particular, those who are enrolled in the senior art class. And then the third aspect of this methodology is the intervention aspect. And so having opportunities to uh, share these stories more widely, whether it's a presentation like this or um, other art exhibitions, um, the Royal Missy Museum has taken interest in screening some of the digital stories. So uh, we're still in the process of figuring out the best ways to um, share the voices, the images, the knowledge um, from the young people with wider audiences um, to speak back uh, and show, you know, those harmful narratives, they're 
they're not the only narratives about this place. And so one um, story uh, as well, in addition to Jackson, they're all wonderful stories, but another one that really resonates for me is Keisha's story. Um, this is home where, uh, and Keisha is a community-based uh, leader and she was a research assistant for the project. Um, so we took a lot of direction from her uh, where she explains why it's important to do this kind of storytelling. Uh, she shares about, um, you know, the the issue of the suicide crisis and why it is important to take note of and, and be aware of, but also that it's not the only story about Attawapiskat. Um, and so if you have time after, I would encourage you to, to log on to the website here. It's, it's open access. You don't actually need to log on, just um, open up the link um, and then click on the youth digital stories aspect and you can see um, all the stories here and uh, also get a sense of, of the beauty of, of this place, of their home. And uh, here's another image of uh, Rosie and young people with the drum. Um, this is from uh, National Aboriginal People's Day. And uh, I had the opportunity to, to visit during um, Aboriginal People's Day in the community and just could feel the celebratory nature of, um, you know, parading, of sharing food together, of music, dancing, um, just that love and connection and a completely different experience than what is depicted by, by mainstream media. And so I think, again, it's really um, important to, to show the, um, the life, this intergenerational knowledge that's being shared um, and to try to challenge those other more harmful narratives as well. And I just love that the shirt that says good vibes and I feel it really sums up the, the energy in this image. Uh, so as I work towards um, a conclusion to allow for some space for discussion and further reflection, um, I want to kind of return to the words that I began with about you are treaty two, um, noticing um, that I have work to do as I reflect on what that means in practice, um, as I've now become a witness to uh, the circumstances of the community and, and a witness to their knowledge. It's not just a witness to the sort of colonial context, but also to the strength and capacity that they have to um, live their lives in a good way um, and continue to educate my colleagues and students about um, you know, respecting indigenous rights and treaties and self-determination. And um, when I think about our curriculum, you know, it's a little bit lacking. We don't have core courses, say, in indigenous governance or indigenous studies. And um, I think um, increasingly we're having units in our courses. There's, there's ways that we, we can improve in terms of how we are um, supporting um, education about uh, treaties and indigenous rights and, and peoples in Canada. Uh, I want to give a shout out to another really great book as well. It's in the, I have it beside me, Treaty Words. I'm often sharing this one with others. Um, it can fit in a Christmas stocking. It's a great gift. Um, and uh, it's by, uh, it's, a, it's a children's book, but I think any, any age uh, will find it of relevance. Um, and it's so powerful and moving. And I have just um, a quote here from Amy Kraft, who is an Anishinaabe legal professor at uh, the University of Ottawa. Um, and a lot of Amy Kraft's uh, words uh, appear in the book with reference to what does it mean to give life to this kind of ongoing iterative treaty relationship that challenges that transactional approach and relationship. So I'll read out this quote here where she says, treaties are not just words written on paper or empty promises. They're not contracts for the sale of land. They are agreements by which our ancestors confirmed that we would share these lands without interference, but with respect for each other. Today, we need to better understand these values and renew these relationships, which build on all of the relationships that have existed for millennia between all parts of creation. These relationships help us understand our responsibilities in these territories we call home. So I think that is a really clear and eloquent way to highlight that a treaty is not just a piece of paper. It's not an archival document. It's not a rigid boundary. Um, it is about a, a relationship and it's something that's alive and ongoing, something I'm still learning about. Um, and also it's, it's place-based as well. It's not, um, there's not a blanket definition or interpretation of um, what a treaty means. So um, with that, I will conclude and invite you to engage in further listening or reading. Um, there's a story map that accompanies the book. Um, 
and uh, have the link here, um, which has excerpts from the book um, in a website format with some colorful images and embedded videos. For example, Adrian Sutherland's music uh, is embedded in this uh, story map, so you could click and, and sort of listen to the music to accompany some of the uh, reflective content that I have there. Um, picking up on this theme of joy and community building, I had the opportunity to um, contribute to a podcast um, a few months ago about that. Um, and then uh, a few years back, contributed an essay, a photo essay about reimagining Attawapiskat as more than a community in crisis. And these are some of the ways that I hope um, that others can engage with these ideas in accessible formats. I know some people love reading books, not everyone likes books, so photo essays, podcasts, story maps, these are some of the ways I try to bring that mixed media storytelling um, aspect to this kind of work. Um, so these are, you know, these are questions that I have that I'm always looking for feedback on, but I'm sure you might have questions for me too, but, you know, who should be listening to these stories? How do we do that intervention? Uh, how can the counter stories, the youth stories influence uh, policy and then, you know, the big question that I started with is, you know, what does it mean to be in a treaty relationship today? Mm -hmm. So I would welcome hearing from others, you know, what it means to you to be in that kind of relationship. Um, would it, you know, depend on, you know, where you live or the communities that you're in relation to. So um, this is how you can get in touch if you're interested in continuing the conversation. And with that, I will hand it over. Thank you so much for listening and for your interest in this topic today. Dr. Sarah, that was amazing. When, when we were, uh, Stephanie uh, put the links in the chat to oh, um, for uh, the treaty words and also for reimagining Um I, I had got to the, I, I'd read the first part of the book and it was, it was pretty harsh, right? Because it was pretty strong critique of the way all of it was handled, uh, the idle no more, uh, Chief Spence's fast, uh, the descriptions of, of the community of Attawapiskat, uh, and then it hit uh, reimagining Attawapiskat, and there was a picture of those three kids in the canoe, and I went, oh, that that sound or that feels so familiar, right? Because so oftentimes that the voice of youth doesn't get brought to the forefront. Uh, being an elementary school teacher for 17 years, uh, uh, I've been well taught by 11 year olds for the most part on how to be a good adult. Um, and so it was, it was such a counterpoint to the adult voices that were predominant, external voices that were predominant in the first part of the book. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, you mentioned it, but can you talk a little bit about how you as a researcher uh, with pretty high level academic training uh, were changed by your uh, by your visits to Attawapiskat by the human and more than human relationships that you developed there? Yeah, I think there's so much I want to pick up on in your comment there. And I know my PhD supervisor used to say, Sarah, stop doing so much throat clearing when you write. Like there's all this kind of dense like data and analysis and words and theory. And, and you know, you want to get to the heart of it, like you said, the picture, the youth, what, what really matters. And that speaks to the reorganization of the book, because initially it was all of that kind of um, historical analysis and the media analysis and the theoretical literature review at the beginning. And then at the end was, you know, Spence's story and then reimagining Adobopscat which um and then the music and so bringing all that further forward i think is is more is kind of an intervention it's saying this knowledge is what you need first um rather than all of that kind of dense um context so it, this experience prompted me to think differently about knowledge and how it's shared and conveyed and presented um and yeah i will say that doing this work has changed um definitely how I think about the role of research and like data collection and um, the words that we use um, to be scholars and academics can be so troubling. I don't even like using the word data, but it's so entrenched in every grant application, every ethics application, like how are you gathering data? And I just hate this idea of reducing people's knowledge and experiences to something like a unit of data, because um, it's always so much more than that. And I was, 
recently on a, a webinar, a professional development webinar that, uh, and the speaker said something that really captured my interest related to this. He said, there's so often a hierarchy of expertise or evidence or knowledge, you know, it's like quantitative data and numbers is the best kind. You need all these stats and generalizable trends. And that's like the, the peak, uh, the pinnacle of knowledge. And then there's other kinds of knowledge that sort of fall below in the hierarchy, whether that's you know, qualitative, community-based, narrative, indigenous, ecological, and, you know, I think we need to interrupt that there shouldn't be a hierarchy of these kinds of knowledges, and um, doing this work just really reminded me of that, you know, people's stories, if you go back and watch um, Jack or Keisha's story, that's so much rich knowledge that is is way more significant than any standardized survey, you know, so I think that, um, absolutely doing this community-based work totally challenges the conventional approach to gathering information, to doing research, to that extractive approach that's been so dominant. Um, and another place of learning, I think, is for government organizations too, that you know they're pressured to gather statistics, but they also need, I think, stories. So I feel like as a as a researcher, we're a bit of a translator trying to bridge these different knowledges. And that's that's part of what I hope that this project can contribute to. We had, uh, when you answered there, you brought to mind two of our previous guests. Uh, Dr. Richard Atlio talked about how his new channel of ancestors embedded that knowledge within stories. And the proof that that knowledge was true was that the new channels were still alive because they followed those stories uh, and they learned from those stories. And another author that we had join us, uh, uh, a friend of yours, uh, Kikita, she joined us a number of, I'm gonna say a couple of years ago to talk about Otter's story, her, her own story and how her research into different languages were embedded in story and uh, how her book came across. Uh, I was always amazed at uh, how children and youth learned a lot and remembered those stories and into adulthood. Um, whereas if I gave them data and numbers to remember as an 11 year old, they might remember it by towards the end of the day, it would be gone. But if it was embedded in the story, they would remember it forever. So uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a little bit about the press um, at the beginning because we see um, how stories are framed and some of the things that we should be aware of that are signals to us that there might be more to it than that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I, I feel like this work um, reminds us that. Um, there's so much power in framing that that what the information we receive isn't neutral. Um, mm. um, at the same time, I I don't want to ever uh, reinforce like skepticism of the news because I feel mm. like we need the media and mm -hmm. we need that. And I know that there are really good journalists that are trying to to cover stories in a good way. Um, and there's probably a need for you know more training as well in terms of how to do that respectfully. Um, but I, I will say, at least during that period of time, when I was looking at media coverage um, around that 2011 to 2013 kind of window of um, kind of the response to um, Teresa's activism and, and leadership, um, that there weren't very many articles that, that, that even looked at what a treaty means. There were a handful that came uh, up with that search. There was much, much more attention paid to those more damaging narratives, the, the blame, mm. you know, and that perpetuates really paternalistic colonial narratives of, um, of Indigenous peoples that are very inaccurate. And there was a lot of criticism from uh, Indigenous leaders about that. And, and, and Teresa Spence, you know, won a federal appeal because of the, the, the problematic nature in which the third party manager was sent in. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it was a really revealing moment of that uh, paternalism. Um, and so I, yeah, I would say that the, the book tries to, again, speak back against that, uh, back against that paternalistic approach. And um, I, 
I'm really hopeful that a lot of policies and media coverage moving forward can bring a much more intersectional lens to their depiction and coverage. And, and for me, what that means is about you know, having a, a breadth of perspectives and um, not just painting communities in sort of black and white or stereotypical ways. Um, and then also um, looking at different um, elements of, of information. So I, I, the kind of coverage that I tend to appreciate the most has like mixed media elements, maybe some mm -hmm. videos or um, uh, audio components. Um, but I know that it takes time to, to to develop these stories in a good way. And sometimes journalists, they're on really short, short time scales. And so that's probably part of it too, part of what perpetuates this certain like ease of, of certain narratives becoming hailed as truths. And um, what what's problematic is when our high level political elites are perpetuating these narratives too. And then the media is covering that. So then there's this kind of like double amplification of these problematic narrative so um mm -hmm. yeah i appreciate earlier when you said i was an activist I was like yes i do feel yeah, like yes. i'm an activist <laughs> we had uh duncan McHugh join us uh, uh to talk about his book too and and talk a little bit about the changing face of journalism uh and bringing more indigenous voices into journalism uh and i was optimistic too that uh, that might change the frames of how uh, conversations happen uh, across all sorts of media um i didn't see any questions in there is okay, one in good. there ted it looks like a real good one okay i the one that's up there from alvaro yeah uh thank you for your presentation i'm connecting from the stolen lands of the nahuatl and lenca peoples of Kakatlan. i am not familiar with the concept of corporeal sovereignty could you tell us more or share some resources online thank you Great question. Thank you. Yeah, that's a juicy one. Yeah, very mm -hmm. theoretical one. <laughs> um, but it's, it's interesting. I had the opportunity to workshop the early drafts of the book, which um, was really helpful. So when I was based at the University of Hawaii, I was um, still kind of writing and, and reflecting. And I remember um, having a workshop with some of my Kanaka Maoli or Indigenous colleagues um, and gave me some feedback about uh, thinking around sovereignty and to kind of together in that workshop we talked about this idea of corporeal sovereignty that like your body can you can enact through your actions a kind of sovereignty and so for example when Teresa Spence engaged in a fast you know deciding how to um, put her body kind of forward on the line as a symbol for um, the failure of, of the crown and of um, the Canadian government to respect and uphold treaty relations, she was enacting that kind of sovereignty, that self-determination on kind of her own terms. Um, so corporeal re refers to kind of bodily embodied uh, enactment. Um, and it, it was a, I want to call it almost like a, a last resort mechanism, you know, uh, to say you're really failing. And it became a symbol of this, this larger failure. Um, and I think there are lots of other examples where this this notion of corporeal sovereignty could apply. And I think of it in a not just that negative way of kind of a loss of one's um, sense of well-being, but a, a call to action for um, acknowledging that that there are better ways to treat um, communities and that um, Canadians and government agencies need to respect the sovereignty, the self-determination of, of all kinds of bodies, individual bodies, uh, indigenous leadership bodies, councils, um, and respect these kind of nation to nation relationships. And um, so I think that her, her action was kind of an embodied expression of these larger um, contextual factors of colonialism, of paternalism, um, of, of decades uh, of neglect, actually. And so it was a, a real strength based um, stance, I think a really strong stance. And that was evidenced by the sort of catalyzing of the I don't know more movement and then these solidarity movements uh, around uh, the world, Canada, across Canada, but around the world. Thank you, Sarah. I, I hope that answered the question for Alvaro. Uh, and uh, from one of our colleagues in uh, the Naimalismo School District, she asks, uh, thank you so much for this. 
Uh, what lessons do you think the media have learned or not with respect to representation, especially of youth voices when it comes to the land back movement? Yeah, well, I think in terms of representation, it's a reminder that um, that it's uh, you need to have consent and that having youth involvement is is essential. Um, and there's so many inspiring young people and youth leaders and and uh, respecting their knowledge and not thinking of them again in a hierarchical way as elders know best or academics or teachers know best. I think we were talking about this earlier, you know, acknowledging the leadership, the insight, the excellence of, of young people um, and, and, and the humility of learning from them. And so I think that um, that's really important. And then again, having kind of consent because there's been a lot of damaging representations of people without consent and um, you know, I'm sure really well-intentioned journalists, but, you know, we'll do documentaries or go to communities and take these pictures and, you know, without names, like you, mm -hmm. you need to have, you talk to people, have the names, have consent to tell the story. And so that's, that ongoing consent is really, really important. Thank you, Dr. Sarah, uh, and all of our guests too, and the ones that have put in questions and listened with us and many have been with us for four years as well. Uh, this has been so helpful continuing our journey of understanding how to be uh, strong allies, how to learn more about the territories that we live on, and how to be a good treaty person uh, wherever you come from. Uh, I've been born and raised in many generations on this island. I come from a treaty community, uh, Tzachis, uh, Fort Rupert on the north end of the island, and learned about Douglas treaties probably when I was in my 30s. So uh, a continuing journey for all of us. Uh, I hope everybody can join us next time too. Again, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Sarah. And uh, please read her book, uh, Life versus States of Emergency. It's a wonderful book and a tremendous story, an important story in the history of Canada. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hey,